So FreeBSD VPC, I gave this talk at AsiaBSD. Um, at, at that time, it was about 85 degrees in the room, and it was the last talk in the day, and so I went through it reasonably quickly. Um, fortunately, this is still the last talk of the day, but in an air-conditioned room, so you're going to hopefully stay awake for it. <laughs> um, so FreeBSD VPC. Uh, what's the state of virtualization in FreeBSD, and why do we care? There we go. Okay. So right now on FreeBSD, the, the extent of what we've got in terms of uh, virtualization is effectively compute isolation. Uh, we have Beehive, it's performant. Uh, we have disk, right? We can do something with the Z-Vol and pass that through. Uh, we can stripe and pass multiple Z-Vols into a guest using um, LVCrate if you've got Linux guests. We've got really good CPU isolation, actually. I was pleasantly surprised by how good uh, the CPU isolation was and you know, mem perfect memory isolation. So we've got a solid story on the compute isolation side of things. But this leaves a fair amount to be desired. On the compute side of things, if you wanted to go do virtualization, you can put together and, and you know, jerry-rig up a system that basically looks like this, where you can take two separate guests and you can put them on the same box uh, using Beehive, and you know, it works. Um, and they can be potentially hostile, and you know, I think everything's great. On the networking side of things, it's not so clear. On the networking side of things, we have VNet, and that's it. Right? The problem with VNet is that on the underlay side of things, on the underlay network, and I'm going to explain what that means in a second if you're not familiar with that uh, terminology, uh, you've got you know, very limited options. And that's potentially problematic. So on the underlay side of things, and with a unified network or underlay network, it's very possible to go and have two customers communicate to each other. You create two tap interfaces, you plug them into a bridge, and you've got network isolation for you know, customer B over here. Customer A, you haven't done anything with. And there's no good way of keeping customer A's traffic separate from customer B. So on the provider side of things, if you're in the business of providing a hosting solution or providing a you know, cloud framework or whatever, there's no compelling way to go about doing this because if you look at what you're doing as a cloud provider, you've got an underlay network where you have the IP address of the physical server, right? Then you have VM workloads. There's no way to, to separate that traffic and provide the necessary encapsulation uh, easily. So if you've got two servers, however, and you, you move beyond the single server scenario, You've got you know, customer B potentially spread across two different servers. How do you bridge these two networks and provide network isolation? So you can do something where you jerry-rig a tap, you plug it into a bridge, and that allows the guest to talk out. But like I said earlier, we've broken network isolation. Right? Tap 50 or customer A, those packets can get over to customer B's traffic. And that's exactly what you don't want. Yeah. So fine, we'll improve upon this, right? Because we have, oops, because we have no isolation here, and everything is fully meshed together, bridged together, um, we can do better, and we can actually provide encapsulation. We can do that using this protocol called VXLAN, and FreeBSD has a VXLAN interface. It's fantastic um, in the sense that it's protocol compatible, and it works, um, and for simple things, it's, it gets the job done. Right? So that changes the structure of this, and you can plug some, plumb something together where now, instead of, of plugging, a, plugging bridges together, you've got a tap to a bridge, bridge to a VXLAN, which you, know, you use to tag uh, the, the VXLAN, uh, so with the VNI. And now you've actually got isolation because when the packet comes back through, bridge to, you know, you, you, the packets from customer A and customer B won't be able to see each other because they've been cap and encapsulated appropriately. Um, but this kind of isolation has a really pro big problem. If you're trying to do compute density, the performance is awful. It's, it's atrocious. Right? If you look at, and if you have done anything inside of Bridge, you'll know what I'm getting at, or TAP for that matter, uh, there's a lot of locking and a lot of copying, and it's, it's, you know, it's piss poor performance. It's one to two gigabits. Right? It's uninteresting. So TAP's slow, 
bridge is slow. VXLAN uh, takes the packet, runs it through IP input twice, so you're, you're running things through the net stack twice. Uh, VNet allows you to virtualize the underlay network, but that's not the problem that we have. The problem that we have is we need to virtualize the overlay network, not the underlay network. Yeah. Um, so the first pass at trying to provide encapsulate, uh, you know, virtualization, uh, or network virtualization, uh, was this utility that we, or this program that we wrote called UVX Bridge, right? It's based off of NetMap, right? NetMap's the hotness right now on the networking side of things. We really liked its design, the fact that we could iterate on it rapidly in user space, uh, and it, that's exactly what it did. We were able to go from nothing to something in a matter of weeks, um, and that, because of developer workflow, uh, was really important. UVX Bridge is all in C, and it worked quite well. So in the new hotness here with, with, with UVX Bridge was we took all these tap interfaces and we plugged them into UVX Bridge. And UVX Bridge provided us with all of the necessary uh, encapsulation and isolation guarantees. Okay. We were able to get 22 gigabits, 21 gigabits per second, right? 15 across the wire. We were able to do AES between different hosts so we could actually send traffic um, to uh, remote you know, AZs or data centers with, you know, hostile network in between, and that was fine. Um, but this was our just our POC, and, and it got the job done, and we were, you know, able to pass on the VXLAN side of things with unencrypted traffic. We were able to pass traffic back and forth between Alumos and FreeBSD, and, you know, it worked. Uh, so 15 gigabits across the wire, it's okay. It was not what we wanted. Um, it got us across the goal that we had at the time. We had a, an internal benchmark goal of getting to um, to 8 gigabits, we got to 15, um, we did that in, and it was like three weeks or something like that. So, but the problem was, is we really wanted to do better than that actually. Amazon came through, this was around the time of reInvent, and they're like, haha, 25 gigabits, and we're like, okay, so the bar got raised. Um, and that's, that's what happens in technology, this, this was actually kind of exciting, because at that point in time, we knew what the limitations were in this piece of technology. We had to necessarily copy traffic from TAP to, you know, the, net, the NIC. In this, our case, we were using Chelsea, um, not EM. Uh, sorry, that was supposed to be an inside joke, because EM can't do what we needed. Um, anyway. So, we needed to figure out a, a different way of doing this where we were reducing the number of pack times that a packet was copied. We needed to reduce the number of context switches, right? We talked to um, ah, the, the NetMap author. I forget his name off the top of my head. I met him at, at HB, this Not Luigi. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, who is it? Vicentio or something? Viceno? Yeah. Um, context switches is actually the problem there. Like, you're going back and forth in context switching between customer traffic and the kernel. And you have to go to user land process called UVX Bridge, which is actually running, um, to go and do that. And so you run into context switch limitations. Who knew? Um, so instead what we wanted to do is revisit the problem and actually think about this in terms of hardware. Right? We wanted to go to a device-centric model. So we came up with this totally new kernel subsystem. Um, it's based off of IFLIB. And the abstractions that were there inside of IFLIB allowed us to both iterate and develop really quickly, and we ended up with something that roughly looked like this. So it's back to conceptually what we originally wanted, right? It was very simple, and we were able to understand how to plumb things together and have these pluggable interfaces and do what it was that we wanted, um, but we were able to get the performance that we wanted, right? And in theory, and, and like this is kind of conceptually what it looks like, but actually what we did was we ended up extending it a little bit more to look closer to what we actually would have in the physical world, where you have a switch with ports, you plug a port into a NIC, right? You give a NIC to a guest, and it's like, you know, the hip bone's connected to the toe bone, and, and you're off to the races. So, you know, we were getting really close, and, and that handled, like we, we wrote a new soft switch, a learning switch. Um, I, you were talking about veil switch earlier today in the eBPF. This is potentially an interesting chunk of code. It performs pretty well. Um, we started out with Veil um, as a reference implementation and optimized it quite a bit. Um, so we wanted to be able to pass traffic, obviously, because being able to do hosting on just a single box doesn't make any sense um, when you have tens of thousands of servers that you need to go in and run the software on. So we need to go and do, you know, provide the network isolation, so we do the XLAN. So in this case, um, you know, what, or more correctly, who knows what VXLAN is? About half the room. 
Okay? So VXLAN is a UDP packet and encapsulates the Ethernet frame effectively um, and allows you to virtualize uh, the underlay network so that, or reuse the underlay network. It's not a very sophisticated protocol, um, but unlike VLAN tagging where you're encapsulating using an L2 packet, we're now encapsulating using an L3 packet. So when I talk about underlay network, we're passing traffic for the, um, the encapsulated Ethernet frame that we would, would come from a guest. Right? So everything that's here in the green came from a guest VM. Everything that's in the yellow came and, and uh, comes from the hypervisor or the host. And then you know, the thing that gets dropped on the wire is you know, that, that red Ethernet frame. Um, so you know, what we wanted to do was be able to pass VXLAN traffic so that if you had a customer guest there, passing traffic to a different customer guest, they would be encapsulated not using a VLAN tag, like if we were using VLANs. Instead, we're using VXLAN encapsulations. We pass and, and tag all the traffic using VNIs or VLAN, VXLAN IDs. Um, so you know, customer A can only talk to customer A because their VNIs are match. Same thing with customer B. So simple, right? So in order to make this all happen, and the way, the way that we were able to do this was we, we constructed this series of pseudo interfaces that were all you know, created using IFLIM. So the first thing we had to do was we created a switch because we knew that we were going to have to have multiple ports that we would then plug NICs into. Um, so the switch is one per customer. Right? We don't have to do any isolation inside of a given um, inside of a given switch, right? We could just, we, the isolation happened just by the virtue of the fact that we had different ports and different NICs plugged into the switch, and we just assumed that traffic would be able to flow. We created lots of switches. Um, or we could have one switch per, switch per customer. Then we needed to create a new NIC. So this is actually one of the things that was really interesting was, was uh, in order to, we didn't want to change the kernel interface for a guest. We wanted to have a guest be able to use a, um, a vertnet guest driver, unmodified, because we were going to potentially take rando Linux images, and we didn't want to go into the guest, like what we had to do with the veil work that we did earlier, where we had a PT netmap guest driver for Linux in order to get kind of the top end performance. We used a vertnet, and we wanted to basically have something unmodified. Well, on the back side, on the, on the host side of things, we had to implement a new kernel driver. So we did, that's vNIC. We plug a vNIC into a vCPP. That is the switch port, and that's where we do our filtering. That's like the equivalent of what Amazon would call a security group or a firewall. It's implemented inside of the switch port, right here. Testing was an important thing, and this actually became interesting. And I think is this is all of a sudden like the scope of what FreeBSD VPC is became really interesting. As soon as during the development, we decided that spinning up a VM to go test, it's slow. It's kind of a pain in the ass, and I really don't want to work in Linux. So we created a different interface that bypasses the host interface and allows us to test things, and that's this VPCI. And that actually became really interesting because then we would go and use VPCI, pass it into a jail, and we could run iperf tests from FreeBSD using the new VPC framework, and we would get VXLAN encapsulated traffic. So from a testing perspective, this was really neat. Question? That's basically what NePair is, right? But it's not implemented in terms of vPair. Um, yeah, we got screaming performance out of this. This was really neat. We did like, I think the, high, the highest single, on a 100 gig NIC, which is what we were actually playing with, I think we got 94 gigabits a second. Um, so like, these are real numbers. This was, this was fun. Um, so then coming out the back end of things, the thing that's doing the actual, like in encapsulation itself is Ethlink. Um, uh, unencapsulated, sorry. We did VPC link for doing the, the uh, encapsulation. And then Ethlink, if we wanted to test without doing uh, VXLAN tag traffic. So, small detour. Uh, who has written cluster schedulers or know what cluster schedulers are? Okay, a couple of people. Uh, who knows that none of them are written in C? <laughs> okay. So, if you're writing something and you're a cloud provider and you want to go in and distribute work, you have to have a way of being able to issue an API call, have that API call, like so a scheduler goes in, just like a CPU scheduler, has to go and figure out where in your data center you're going to go and allocate a unit of work. Uh, that, the, the Kubernetes, Nomad, uh, Mesos is C, it's close to C, um, but 
specifically Nomad and Kubernetes, they're both written in Go. And if you were in my BOF talk earlier, you kind of heard a little bit of hints and rumblings about why you never want to use C Go. Um, so from an interface design, user interface design, or user land interface design, we explicitly avoided libc. And we went and spent some cycles trying to figure out how to integrate the kernel element of things, FreeBSD VPC, with the user land utility so that we could integrate this with cluster schedulers. So having you know, been around the block, the way that you would normally do this in FreeBSD is you would just create a new IOCTL because like, that's what everybody does. They create a brand new IOCTL and they just cram more things through the system interface. But it's a pain in the ass for basically everybody. Nearly impossible to secure. Uh, and it's just this generic dumping ground for you know, input output in and out of the kernel. So then we were like, that's probably a poor way of going about this. So we could go do something that, that is um, storage-esque or, you know, I don't know where exactly this kind of design primitive came from, um, where, where or why people copy it, but we could go and do the, the dev whatever interface. And we were thinking about whether or not that was an appropriate thing. And it was like, well, do we really want to mix and match the network with VFS primitives? Um, you know, I, DevD, who knows? Uh, I wish I was actually in Warner's talk earlier. But um, so we decided that like, matching the network with the uh, network primitives with VFS primitives um, was not OK. So we moved on from that idea. And we decided that we were going to go and create a new set of system calls. So we created something that's very file descriptor-like on purpose. So you have, and it's, it's, if you've done file I.O., this is going to be somewhat similar, except for we're not doing file I.O., we're configuring um, if lib or VPC interfaces. So the first thing that we did in, in VPC is you can open an interface or create an interface. Those are different flags to VPC open. You can, once you have something, uh, an open descriptor, then you can go and manipulate and manage it. The, when you open a descriptor, you assign the capabilities and privileges to that descriptor, which means that from a sudo perspective or a set UID, you actually can build administrative tools around this and not have to worry about securing it. Because it's done inside of, like, um, you don't have to do anything different more correctly. Um, and then the last one is, 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 at the time we were trying to be compatible with Triton, uh, and which is the control plane that the giant used to have. Um, and um, so we used UUIDs for everything, which was kind of an interesting choice because UUIDs and FreeBSD are, you know, they exist, but they're not widely used. Um, so what's the open, VPC open syscall look like? Um, so you open up an ID, you generate an ID in advance, user land, right, because you're the one telling the kernel what this, this identifier is. The, the cluster scheduler knows where everything's in theory going to be laid out. So you generate the ID in advance. Um, you pass in the object type along with the ID and then whatever miscellaneous flags that you have. You pass close to it just like you would anything else um, and you've got these privileged uh, separation semantics. Um, one of the things that was interesting also that we deliberately did on purpose because we're avoiding libc was we encoded version information into the syscall. So unlike, in order to avoid the possibility of having to use libc in the future, we took on ownership of versioning our own API. So we did that. And that actually ended up being really convenient. Um, and hopefully will be reasonably future proof. So what's a VPC ID? Because it's view UID like, it's not exactly a UUID. Uh, we actually encoded the object type in the UUID. So if you get a large, if you've ever had done anything with UUIDs, they're opaque, random garbage, right? Um, so we, from a usability perspective, we decided that was not okay. And we, we decided to hijack various bits inside of the UUID. Uh, the node object back here provides a default for the MAC address. So we decided to reuse some of this stuff. You can override the MAC address from a UUID or from a VPC ID. Um, but it turned out that like, there's, there's some convenience to having duplicated information here and there. Um, and then we also have the object type. This means that from an administrator and from a tooling perspective, you can write a rando tool that will take a VPC ID and it'll tell, it has encodes some information and it'll tell you what exactly is there. So we only hijacked the last couple of fields and that was all that was necessary for the time being, knowing that if we needed to, we could potentially um, you know, take more bits and steal more bits if we needed to. I'm not gonna go into that, I just said it. Um, 
because we took ownership of the interface, uh, we also, you know, when I said that we, we were going to create a new handle and, and get something out of this, uh, did it, where am I? Uh, version number. Um, we have the ability, and we padded this so that we can potentially expand the version number. We think that we only need 16 versions if you've ever done API design. If you're getting close to 16, you probably don't know what you're doing, and you need to go and reevaluate a bunch of things. Um, most of the time, like hopefully we'll get to like version 2 or maybe version 3, and that'll be it. Um, but we wanted to take ownership of, of the future effectively. And like I said, avoid having to do anything in libc. Come on. There we go. Uh, so object types. We took this, these, the, the, uh, these particular constants, and we cooked them into both the VPC ID and we passed it in the open. This checksum ended up being, you know, convenient because, or convenient. It ended up being uh, really important as we were doing the development because this acted as basically a checksum for us. Anyway, the gist of it is, is we have 16 versions available. We can have 255 objects, uh, object types, and uh, you know, if we needed to go in and chew into our padding, we can get up to 40, 80 objects, and that should be enough for everybody, right? There we go. Okay. Um, so flags, they're not nothing sophisticated here. Um, it's just a bit field. The uh, other thing that we did end up doing after I put this presentation together was we began to add ex extended privilege capabilities for the object type um, so that we could cook that into the flags. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, the VPC cuddle. So this was actually the meat and potatoes. So you open up a descript, uh, you do VPC open, you get a descriptor back. Uh, the more interesting part is what happens in VPC kettle. This is how you interact with this. This is basically a IOCTL-like uh, um, syscall that you can do get and set operations with. Uh, yeah. So there's a bunch of different operations. Each set of operations is keyed to a particular object type. We did this so that we didn't have to go back. So if you have your, your VPC uh, it's just dying. That's what's going on. Um, so VPC opt T, that is per object type. Those object, the operations are tied to the object that you're interacting on, which was determined at the time that you opened up the descriptor. So the number of operations is specific to the object type. In the case of a VPC switch, there's only a certain number of operations that we needed to do. We need to be able to add, update, you know, change the link state, do some of the basics there. Uh, so we could extend this if we needed to, right? There's no shortage of, of available bits. On the port side of things, we need to potentially go and set the, the V tag. So if you wanted to have different subnets within the same customer, the way you should do that in a physical network is you would have a different subnet, which would probably be on a different VLAN, right? So you can set the VLAN tags for a given customer, and you you push that information into the port, so you have to open up the VPC port on a switch and say that, that all traffic coming from this port is now a part of a different you know, VLAN. Right? On the NIC side of things, the, from a performance perspective, which is where we originally started, the thing that was most important for us to be able to set and get was the number of queues. And at the end of the day, like. We had effectively an arbitrarily complex configuration that we needed to decompose and figure out how to interact with from both user land and then how to organize it inside of the kernel. Using these two syscalls, we were basically able to conquer that and put together a, a compelling interface that we could then integrate into either a cluster schedule or a user land tooling. Um, but then really at the end of the day, because we did do this in terms of iflib, um, performance was really nice um, because that was just, all of this was just a thin wrap around the hardware capabilities that were there. So at the end of the day, we had uh, something that because we did this with a, both a, a stable API, KPI, um, we had something that we could then foist into Go, um, which provided us uh, something, uh, provided us with a, Cross uh, a tool chain that allowed us to do development on a Mac, or you know, we had some people doing Windows development, and they could just work together on different operating systems without having to have a physical FreeBSD box nearby. And this was really novel. This allowed us to iterate at a, a nice clip. Um, and if you've ever had to do cross compilation, this sucks. 
uh, and it was easy for us to do in Go. So, uh, so ELI 5, this is Reddit term, uh, explain like I'm 5. Uh, VPC had a few assumptions, right? The first one was is that the host was going to provide multiple TXRX queues in the host. We'd be able to plumb that through to a guest. The guest is going to be running Ubuntu or CentOS. Those were our primary two operating, uh, Linux operating systems. Um, if you were outside of that, you know, who knows. Um, in order to make this entire system work, the assumptions that we had were that all physical servers were able to route traffic. Right? So on the underlay, we had a fully mesh network in the sense that we could pass traffic between any other underlay host. Um, and that in this particular case, in, in, in the next diagram, all the hosts are on the same subnet. Uh, we did not tackle routing to begin with, but we do have a VPC router construct um, that is on, on its way at some point in the future. Uh, so in this case, right, this is what I was showing you earlier. Uh, we have ports, NICs, switches, and then ethlink if we wanted to have, you know, untagged traffic. So in order to create this, right, what's it look like to, from a user land perspective? So you have your awful UUID that is totally unusable, um, except for it's got your type information, uh, 01. You see that? Uh, I would, this is the laser pointer, no, no batteries. Um, so the 01 there is the type, and then the you know FA, that's the, the default MAC address. Anyway, create a switch, okay? And I say all traffic on the switch is a part of a VNI, which, or has a particular VNI, which is the same equivalent of a, a network domain. So we created the switch. Then we went and created a series of NICs. Right? So we said create the NIC, create the switch, take the switch port, add the NIC to the switch port. Right? You, you take a switch port and you connect an interface, which is the VNIC that you created up there. Okay, so we've basically created a VNIC, plug, plugged it into a port, into a switch. This is where we are right now. Then we wanted to go and do the exact same thing for guest three in this case. So we did that. The only thing that's different between any of this stuff, now you go, was we changed some of the IDs up here. So the MAC address was just a little different. Other than that, it's all the same. Same VNI, that's the important thing. Same VNI and same VLAN ID. Um, on the, in order to drain packets out of the switch, right, and basically drop those those guest frames um, out to the underlay, we went and created a uh, an uplink port. So switches have a designated port on the switch that's called an uplink port, uh, and it's basically a magic default port for switches. And then you specify the the ETH link or the drain ID, and there you go. So, but you know, obviously that didn't tag the traffic, so how do you do that, right? How do you figure out, how do you get from customer one guest A, how do you figure out that on the underlay network, the traffic needs to go to, you know, 1065.162? This is the hard part about VXLAN, is if you're customer one guest A, how do you do ARP, right? It's not possible to do ARP. You can't broadcast to everybody, right? You, if you've got... 20,000 physical servers in a data center, you can't broadcast to all other physical nodes, hoping that all servers with VNI 123 and VLAN tag 456 are going to somehow respond. That's an atrocious problem. You can't do that. So what do you do, right? You've got no multicast. I don't know of any cloud provider actually that has multicast. So we didn't you know, that's out of, out of scope. And um, so we, didn't we don't have multicast, we don't have broadcast. How do you figure this out? Uh, well, in order to do that, you have to capture broadcast coming out of the switch. You have to make an up call out of the kernel that says, I need to go and do what's called VTAP or VLAN tunnel endpoint resolution. I need to figure out where the IP address and the MAC address and all the miscellany, the necessary bits are to get tra guest traffic from from overlay network on host A to overlay network on host B. So we added a KQ interface and a KQ filter so that the up we could just listen like we would on any other KQ interface. Um, we put a filter for VPC. We just passed the raw packet up. We 
process and parse the packet in user space using Go. Google has a and released a bunch of very nice uh, packet processing libraries um, in user space. So we use those. At that point in time, we rip apart the packet. We figure out what it is that we need to do. We, we use VPC kettle in order to push back or push down into the, uh, into the guest the response. And then that re-injects it back into the switch and sends the response packet back to the guest. So now the guest now has, you, we've basically completed ARP here. And then the switch holds on to that so that we don't have to perform that up call again. One of the things that we do that's a little tricky is we hold on to the MAC address permanently because we make MAC addresses immutable. Uh, minus one detail that I probably won't get into in this talk, but that's an important element. Uh, where are we now? So, go ahead. Uh, does like to really answer how hypervisors uh, should look? Mm -hmm. How they connect? I mean, you have some demon running a between them? No, we don't have. So, yes, I guess, they, fair enough. Um, so, in this particular case, um, it's a good question. Uh, in this particular case, what happens is, ha in order to get traffic from the two hypervisors on the two hosts, uh, we, ha we create the guest, Nick, we pass it in, and in the NIC, the switch, everything along the way, we've, we've basically plumbed kind of this, this uh, I don't want to call it circuit, but I'm going to use the word circuit. We've, we've plumbed this circuit so that everything coming out from, from guest one customer A all the way through is encapsulated with VNI 123 and VTAG you know, 456, right? The, the ARP discoveries? They don't, though. That was the point. That was the point. So I, I missed the detail, I guess, that I need to explain. So the switch, VPC switch zero plugged into guest one customer A yes. does a K-note write that notifies a user land daemon that says we've got a packet here, a broadcast packet for a guest coming from VNI 123, VLAN 456. Please to be satisfying this ARP request. And so there is a program running on this top server on dot one sixty one that's running in the host that receives this up call, does a lookup in our metadata database, and that's what has the the information and, and tells us that the VM let's see that guest one uh, guest one on server dot one six two, right or the, this I'm sorry. I've been saying something wrong here. Um, so 1065.5.161, that is the IP address in the overlay. That's the IP address of the guest, okay. right? So, so Not the host. So you have external database yes. where, where every VM resides on every hypervisor. Yes. So there's never a direct communication between hypervisors to establish the relation. They just ask the database. Correct. The Only for the first packet. Yeah. Right. Course. Yeah. Sorry, so that was a very important detail. I did gloss over that. I apologize. So that exchange between the hosts and the it's, it's VXLAN. So everything coming from, from guest one customer A on the host one to guest one uh, customer A on host two, that is this stream of UDP packets. No, no, no. Oh. It doesn't. So we do the exact same thing. So if, if if you're sending a packet from, from guest one customer A, uh, from, from you know, red to red, on the, the egress, we do the lookup on the top host. Lookup from a database established how? By the, by the contract? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Thank you. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, Sorry, there is assumption, a couple of assumptions that I skipped over. I apologize. Yeah, good. So it's not truly VXLAN going on in the middle because VXLAN has its own mechanism for doing this. So there's it's a not compatible with any other VXLAN the, implementation. The on the wire. So this is kind of the, the semi dirty secret. So the on the wire protocol is compatible, right? The mechanism for doing VTEP is is per implementation specific. Okay. Um, so the, we can interoperate and pass traffic between, in this case, FreeBSD and Lumos, and that works. Right? Now, what, for instance, Lumos would do in this case, they use a totally different metadata lookup mechanism than what we did in FreeBSD. However, the traffic still passes. The reverse traffic, and let's assume, going back to the original example where these are both FreeBSD guests, or FreeBSD hosts, if 
in the return path, so if you send a ping, in order for the echo reply to come back, the, on the first packet, this switch on the second host has to do the same metadata lookup on its side of things in order to complete a, a, a symmetric route for forwarding. So like really, really large uh, number of guests, mm -hmm. like help me, because you said you're doing on egress in each mm -hmm. direction. How, I mean, how much traffic does that generate on the initial metadata lookup? And it's a Postgres lookup. Okay. It's a single select. And like because we have the VNI, the host, the MAC address, like the everything, it selects to a single row. We walk, navigate a B tree, and then we return a packet, and then we cache it permanently. So we don't do this per packet. We only do this for the first flow between two separate hosts. So like, it, I, mean, I guess the upper bound is like whatever the size of like the network is. Yeah. Or yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you do. Um, that's a more complicated thing. Uh, what we do is that we actually treat this closer to ARP, and we just expire the entries. We just age it up. Like it's it's hard for us to go and do this like large distributed cache invalidation. There is something we have to do fancy for IP address moving, which I'm I'm going to try and avoid if I can. Um, um, we have something that kind of call it cloud ARP. We're not sure what the hell we're going to call it, but um, uh, yeah. So. So that's this, so the thing though that is provider specific or implementation specific is this thing called VTEP. Um, when you're not doing multicast or, or you know anything else like that, the VTEP protocol is is uh, provider specific. The on the wire is would well that, defined. I get that you're not doing because you don't have the need, but how hard would that be to extend to do the more generic multicast that I know like uh, uh, you know, for another people any clue? I have zero interest in going uh, down multicast anywhere, and I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. Anybody interested in stable multicast? Um, so things that are uh, outstanding is um, firewalling. Uh, that's going into VPC port. Uh, routing, how do you go and pass traffic between separate subnets? How do you go from a private IP address out to the internet? The, the work is not complete. Um, as somebody that I work with told me, there's a small speed bump, and we're working through it. Um, so yeah. Um, and integrating Beehive, which is the VM management, with the, net, the and, and hardware isolation element things with the network isolation. So it's a single tool. Uh, what does the actual tool itself look like? You know, this is where we're going with this. So we're going to wrap Beehive with VPC commands, so just a VPC VM, because there's tight coupling between a VM and the network context that it's running inside of. Um, so interesting. Uh, can you can I put a pin in that real quick? I'm almost done, and then we'll come back to the slides. And this, uh, yeah, we'll go off the rails here shortly. Um, so, uh, true story. We will. I watch. Just watch. Um, so one of the things that was really interesting. Who has ever used Packer before or VMware on your laptop? Right. Everybody. So when we were doing this, we were like. This would be a great mechanism to go and have VMware on a laptop effectively. And when I say VMware, I mean like I need on a laptop to go and spin up a VM, and I don't want to have a priori knowledge of the IP address space that I'm working in. Right? That sucks. What I really want to do is I want to go and create an IP address, you know, a VRF or an IP address space. I want to put an IP address or DHCP and just be able to spin up a VM and not have to configure anything. And you can actually do this now, right? Like this was one of the novel things that came out of VPC. Um, as, as soon as we started talking about NAT, we were like, we can actually have something that's usable on the laptop to go and be able to spin up random, you know, sandboxed environments and IP address spaces um, and provide program isolation. Uh, right now, if you're using Vagrant or Packer, there's actually a hard dependency on for both of those tools on PF and DNS mask, and that's, you know, fine. But I don't want to live in that world. I definitely don't want to live in a world where I'm depending on PF. I will say that. Open BSD. Okay. Um, so uh, the kernel uh, work is uh, joint FreeBSD. It's on the Projects VPC branch. The kernel bits for Go, we ha so the, all of the Go interfaces, you'll see go.freebsd.org. I'm going to be talking to Cluster Adden again this trip, and I'm going to get that finished and pushed out um, so that we can begin to vendor and merge and integrate some of this stuff and begin using it because this framework is being used by IFLIB to configure IFLIB devices and interfaces. Um, having seen the rate at which we were able to get things done with IFLIB, I'm a huge proponent of its use. Okay, now I can go back to questions because I was like, I'm almost there. So your question was, 
packet check some offloading? Yeah, last time I checked for previously for NVX land, it didn't support any packet checking. So we're not using any of the traditional software that was in FreeBSD. This is completely net new. Um, so where this says EM0, this is a Chelsea O'Nick, right? Um, we used a single PF for everything. Uh, and I didn't talk about the performance. So we ended up doing ETH. I will get there. F this. ETH link traffic. We were doing 86 gigabits of iperf traffic from a single VM. On a single TCP stream, we were doing 56 gigabits, I think, on a single TCP stream with 1,500 MTU packets. This was really good performance. When we went and cranked up the number of TCP streams, we were doing 86 gigabits. This was three times faster than Linux, using Mellanox and VFs and hardware offload. When we did VXLAN encapsulation using VPC link, and we were VXLAN encapsulating here, we were doing 67 gigabits, and we screwed things up a little. And so that number is actually not right. Uh, at that point, we were doing 67 gigabits of encapsulated traffic, but we could have done more. The reason we didn't do more is because we didn't do the pacing right. So we were actually overrunning the physical switch here, and it was dropping packets. And if we would have done a better job of pacing at the time, then that number would have been higher and probably much closer to the 86 gigabits that we were getting with just the VLAN tag and capped traffic. So this was phenomenal. And there's nothing that was preventing us from doing this over LACP. Yes. Uh, well, hold on, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we did. So we did do 1450, if we needed to, but um, for some of our environments, we also did 1526 here. So we could do 1500 to the guest without fragmentation. I don't want to call them jumbo frames, but they're not 1500. Right. They're not 9K. Was the important part, right? They don't actually, not until, you, like, it depends on your switch vendor, not until you hit, like, 1,900 bytes, and then there's, like, this huge jump to, like, 7 or 8K uh, frame size. And that's because switch vendors have, like, long had to deal with things like Q and Q and other miscellaneous traffic that, like, slightly bumps the size of the frame to be a little bit larger than 1,500, so that's not out of this world. So anyway, you can run it with normal 1,500 yeah. outside of something smaller. Yep. Yep. All you have to do is change the, the guest here, the guest MTU size to be 15, uh, 1,450. Um, if you did want to do full 1500 for the guest and you wanted to do IPv6 here, um, then you set the NPU on the underlay to 1576 or 1574, I forget the number. But yeah, it works. Is there a reason not to do jumbo frames if you control the entire cloud? Um, yeah, if you're a guest traffic here, or guest, it's, how do you get your traffic out to the internet? Like, we did try, we, so we were able to saturate, and it was less than a percent difference. We were really impressed by the performance that we were able to get, and jumbo frames didn't buy us anything. So, question? Yeah, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, the question is basically, at why, what size of, of the network, or under what conditions would you even say you need VX plans at all, not just normal layer of TV runs? Um, if I've got, com if these customers here are hostile, I can't have them on the same VLAN. At some, but I'm going to run out of VLANs. I've only got 4096 VLANs. Okay. And VXLAN is a, is a, what was that? So it, is not it limits the, num the it's number of customers and the number of subnets per customer. Oh. So VXLAN is a 24-bit is a tw uh, number, so that's 16 million. And then I throw a VLAN tag on top of that, and I've got another you know, 4096 per customer. So I can have 4096 subnets per guest, or per customer, I mean. Right, and then I can have 16 million customers. Okay, so that's it's not around the size of data center; it's yeah. about customers. Yeah, Honestly. and cu and cu and customer configuration complexity. Okay. I don't care how many subnets you really you have, because I will spill you over to a different different VNI if I have to. Uh -huh. um, like, but we have account limits. Like, this is why you have to go talk to Amazon and get them to raise your account limits. Or, so, so 
What is this? What's the order of, of, of tagging here? So you have the external 24 bit. So, the, yes, yeah, so the traffic coming out of the guest is a normal 1500 MTU. When it goes through the VPC switch, or it's actually the VPC port here. No, no, not the MTU. The, how many tag, tagging headers can you add? Uh, uh, because you talk Just one. There's one VLAN tag, and then there's one VXLAN tag. Okay, so the customer still gets also normal VLAN the cut. Yep, we don't change that at all. We take the entire packet and pass it through. Right? No, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Can you pass through trunk VLANs, multiple VLANs, yeah. any of that yeah. kind of stuff? Doesn't, yeah. yeah. On the underlay, like the frame, the IP, the header, and inside of here, in the Ethernet fretter, you can, we, we put a, we can put a normal 802.1Q tag, right? Doesn't matter. And whatever a customer is doing on their encapsulated side, it's a, that's their business. I don't care if they're spewing garbage, I'll bill them. <laughs> <laughs> Self-correcting problem. <laughs> Next question. A little more about the relationship between the black lines within the host and the actual uh, rings available on the server. Yeah, good question. So queues, <laughs> NIC queues. So we were using, in our case, we were using Chelsea. We had uh, 1024 queues, I think, available. And what we were doing was we took eight queues, and we figured out that this is actually about the sweet spot for Linux, because e-Linux. Um, we pass eight, eight NIC queues through to each guest, and we would actually map the queues straight from the NIC to the guest. We didn't use a VF or anything like that, but it was, you know, we would use eight queues, um, and that worked out okay. We kept it as a configurable option inside of the vNIC. Um, we did make the interfaces, and a lot, I didn't I kind of glossed over it, but I think I wrote it up on the slide, was we made vNIC uh, immutable, so once you set the number of queues, we didn't want to have to deal with like notification of a guest or bouncing of a guest for the uh, dependency change. Um, we just forced the recreation of that, um, but eight by default works pretty well. Um, and we just mapped those through. Did that kind of answer your question? No. Okay, other questions? Just checking my understanding about the VLANs. Yeah. Um, your uh, orchestration has to provision VLANs, right? Because your um, ARP and neighbor discovery uh, Yes. So we would push that into the VPC switch port that was here. And uh, yes, but we were aware of this. We didn't have to do programming of the physical underlay network. right? That was one of the important things is this gave us, we took all of the control and configuration that would be necessary to push into hardware, and we offloaded it into software. So, so, but I guess the, the check is yeah. you do sort of care what your customers use, or at least Yeah, so we actually supported, this, oh, so this is an interesting point. So we actually supported uh, VLAN tagged and un-VLAN tagged traffic coming out of guests because we wanted to support routing of guests, like the guests to be able to bridge their own networks. Um, yeah, so we allowed for that, but we did have a mask in here so that we could actually, like on the VPC port, we just like you would have on a normal physical switch, you can say like, you know, the, your, we're only allowed VLANs 10 and 11, and you tried passing something in VLAN 11, and that's still on the overlay. It's not underlay here. Nothing, cu nothing customer facing could influence the operational characteristics of the underlay network itself. Yeah. Next. This is something that can customer get access for, so he gets contact frames, but with yeah. the network, they will get still So this is so speaking of. Blah, 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 Going back to when I was talking about uh, NAT and firewalling, I'm just going to hand fake with this. Um, so what you can do is you can actually pass in a VNIC, and on instead of EM0, we actually have to create a second interface here um, with a different MAC address, and that has the underlay IP address, and then we can create a VNIC that we plug into the, the cloned interface, and that would allow for public IP addresses potentially to be mapped directly to a guest or for a provider managed service to go from a public IP address natted by the, by the host and then passed through as what Amazon would call an ENI. Or an ENI, but an EIP. Totally oh. <laughs> All right. How do we provide the customer access to the outside? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my, my use case would be different. I have a physical PTSD machine yep. on which I would like to terminate the VX VLAN, like without any 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 VMs on it. 
That's so that would be just a router process, like a router, and that's not finished. Um, so you would take an unencapsulated frame that would hit the VPC switch. You would run it through a, uh, at the Ethlink. It would hit a router, and then it would drop an, un uh, an encapsulated frame or, or an unencapsulated frame if necessary to be able to talk to another host. It's really like we deliberately built it so that it was a matter of configuration and plumbing things in differently um, as a series of space, as if you, if lib is basically a bunch of handler callbacks um, so that it's semi-arbitrary how you want to configure this. This, however, is like the common case. There's, you know, if you need to do portability um, or you need to integrate with an existing infrastructure where you're getting untagged frames that's a part of a given subnet, that's a supported config. Go ahead. Yeah. You could, uh, in theory, you should be able to. You can't because you can't use bridge if bridge because if bridge doesn't play by nice rules in terms of performance. Um, so you would use a VPC switch, but yes, it does show up if you do if config. You can you can see all of these VPC interfaces. It's a really big list if you get carried away. You, yeah, so there's, there is IP checking. So if you, when you put an IP address on a VM NIC, um, inside of the guest, you have, like, I didn't get to DHCP, and I'm, please don't ask about it. Um, but uh, the, the guest will have an IP address, and then that's actually enforced at the port as well. Okay, so that complicates things. See, don't ask. Life's better that way. <laughs> DHC, you have to do something special, just like you capture broadcast for uh, v4 ARP or v6 neighbor discovery, we also have to capture DHCP. And then we up call that through the same interface that I was talking about earlier. Now, we didn't get to DHCP yet, which is why I'm saying don't ask about it. Um, uh, there's only so many hours in the day. And, but yeah, we didn't get to that, but that's what effectively would have to happen. Um, there's some, um, uh, yeah, ask me afterwards about ARP. I'll, I'll, can, or not ARP, but moving IP addresses. How do you do all so that's what we did to begin with. That was one of the things that we did do is we captured everything and, then, and we had a DHCP listener that, that um, masked out and prevented broadcast traffic from hitting the underlay. And then we had a sidecar go process that was actually acting as our DHCP that server. Complicated. If you have, can you plug an inter, can you plug it to the VPC switch, yeah. an interface yeah. that would have IP address that would go to the IP stack of the hypervisor? Mm -hmm. You can just run DHCP relay on that. We could. Yeah, it, it, we could have done that. Um, we already had a, we had a mechanism already for parsing IP and ripping open IP addresses, um, and we already had a KQ a K note notification in order to do the up call. So, yeah, six to one, it, not a bad idea, because um, we did do something very similar in the past. Uh, there's there's a little bit of complications there when you're bridging between the encapsulated network and the non unencapsulated network, but yeah, so authentication. It sounds like you mentioned about access to all of this except for the, I'm assuming, relatively very complicated Postgres piece that actually does the VT, the, the VTAP. Yeah. Is that also out there or no? That actually, the schema design is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's there. So what's kind of the end of the story here? Is it still proof of concept and once you finish those other bits, it gets used or is it? That is, <laughs> find me later. <laughs> find me later. <laughs> Very interested in seeing this move forward. And yeah, we should talk about that. I, there were a few other hands that were up a second ago, but okay. This is a complicated story. Other questions? I get the feeling you know some of this. <laughs> I, appreciate the, I appreciate the troll, sir. <laughs> Um, yeah, so 
the work is, is interesting. It's moving forward. Um, we did do a number of things. We went and created a new MBUF, um, MVEC, which we need to go and unify. Um, uh, I apologize, I didn't get back to you on email about that, actually, now that I remember. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a substantial body work. This was north of 100,000 lines of kernel code that showed up over three months. Huge thank you, infinite thank you to Matt Macy for making a lot of this happen, um, and the community as well. Uh, there was a, a number of things that went into this, so uh, NavDeep was in particular helpful along the way. Um, I know I'm going to forget others, so yeah. Anyway, with that. Sold.